um, if you'd want to check that out. So before we get to Dr. Nay's presentation, we're going to have Lori Lofton talk to us a few minutes. Um, and she is the water conservation coordinator uh, for the ACC Public Utilities uh, Department. And um, we're lucky to have her here to speak to us tonight. So um, it, uh, if you would, Lori, please take it away. Sure, thank you so much, Carrie. I am thrilled about today's topic, water wise gardening. And I don't know about you, but I have been even more excited about all of the rain that we have been having. We had, uh, when we're looking about into drought and whether or not we need to adjust our watering schedule, we rely on the Georgia EPD to let us know whether or not we have moved into drought conditions that warrant a declaration of drought. And they will look at the US drought monitor, the soil moisture, what they're looking for is how well we have the resources we need to supply the county with water. So if you're looking and thinking, my plants are wilting and dying out here, why isn't the drought being declared? Why aren't we changing our watering schedule? That's because they're looking at it more from that perspective of how much water do we have for our population? And when they, we don't, we can petition and ask for a variance if we think that we are running low on our water supply, we can ask them to go ahead and put in some drought restrictions, but at the moment they have not, and this rain um, is really helping. So even if it's ruining your plans for the weekend or anything like that, I'm thrilled by it. I'm here to let you know a little bit about a program that we have. I'm gonna share my screen with you for just a moment. Just a moment here. A program that we have created is the H2 Grow Native Plant Collection. We partnered with Kofor's Home and Garden Supply Store to put together this promotion. And what it is, we had a student, a graduate student with the Landscape Architect Department at UGA. And she helped us to come up with some design plans for gardens using drought tolerant plants, all native plants. and there are four different styles that you can choose from. One of them we, we is brand new for this year, which is the Vibrant Oasis. And we also have one that is for shade. When you download the guide, it will show you what it looks like when it all comes in, assuming everything works as it should. And I'm assuming you guys are much better gardeners than I am. I haven't gotten mine to look like that yet but there is a garden design. The layout is where, as far as where to put them, which plants to pick, a little bit of information about each plant, as well as on the backside, maintenance, how to care for the garden all seasons and watering tips. I really like this. Again, you all are gardeners, so you're better at this than I am, but for me, I don't know which plants to get. I don't know how to arrange them once I get it. So this is perfect for anybody you know that needs some help with it. It takes all the guesswork out of planning your landscape. The other thing I wanna let you know about is that in the month of August, although since you guys are here, you could go ahead and come in starting tomorrow if you're interested. We are doing our annual automatic shutoff nozzle spray giveaway. These are required to be used on hoses according to the Georgia Water Stewardship Act. And obviously, Put this on here when you're not watering it cuts off the water so that you are not losing water we also have these moisture sensors that you can get that you put into the soil and it has a little gauge on there that will let you know if the soil is dry moist or wet so it's like a goldilocks sensor to let you know whether or not you're just right and the other thing i want to let you know about if you're not familiar with this we also have something called water smart Water Smart is an online water management tool free to all athens Clark County customers. And by registering your water account, you just go to accgov.com slash watersmart, you register your account and you can view your water use by the hour. If you're wondering how much water are you using with your sprinkler, you're watering, you have the sprinkler set for 10 o'clock at night. You're wondering how much water does that use? Well, at 10 o'clock at night when your sprinkler goes off, Make a mental note to yourself, don't use any water 
doing anything else in your house from 10 to 11 and check back the next day. Click on track my use. You can click on the bar graph that pops up and view by the hour how much water you used and you'll know how much water your yard drank, how many gallons of water your yard consumed at that time. So those are a few tips as far as how to use water wisely, how to save water. And I'm gonna pass it back and I appreciate you all giving me a few minutes to talk with you. I look forward to tonight's topic. Thank you, Lori, I appreciate that. I uh, love the moisture meter. Um, I use that a lot in my garden because I don't always know when things are watered. You can't always just tell by looking. So right, it's right. a really, really great tip. Thanks for being here. You did and I got, I got excited when I saw that, Lori, when you emailed me because Carrie and I have one here at the, the office and ours just got run over by a lawnmower. So we'll be stopping by your office again. <laughs> when I was little, my aunt had one of these, my great aunt, and she would take me around the house and say, let's let the plants talk to us. And so I thought the plants were talking and telling us something. So that's amazing. It's, it's fun to, and I'll say trick them. But, and the other thing too, with what we recommend with watering your yard, as far as grass goes, if you step on the grass and it bounces back, you do not need to water it. It, it It's good. Um, if it's a little crunchy, then, then you might want to water it or, or let it, or let it go brown. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Lori. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so now we're on to the main event, and I'm thrilled uh, for y'all to be able to um, see Laura's presentation on water-wise gardening. Uh, so if you're ready, Laura, take it away. If you want to, I don't think you're screen sharing anymore, but. Yeah, I'll take the screen back. Let me just double check since I'm resharing. Are you guys seeing the full screen, not the note screen? Excellent. We got it. All right. We're good to go then. Uh, like Carrie said, feel free, especially on a night like tonight, we have a, a very reasonable sized roof. So I'm not too worried about uh, pausing and having some uh, conversation as we go through the presentation. So if something comes up and you want to ask a question as I'm talking, feel free to throw that in the chat and Carrie can moderate and kind of um, chime in and, and get me to answer. And if, if there's too many coming in, or we're running out of time, we don't get to you during the presentation, at, we'll invite everybody to open up their mics and, and we can just chat after the presentation as well. And I'm happy to stay a few minutes after it, you know, even if we're past time. So don't worry, if you have questions, we definitely wanna answer them. So, all right, I'll get go ahead and move on. Let's get on to the real presentation here, but my little, there we go. So, so we're gonna talk about water-wise gardening, which I think you probably have gathered by now since you've, and I'll throw on my, so it's like I'm really speaking with you, Helen. Um, and Laurie was a great introduction to that. Water-wise gardening can mean a lot of different things. Um, obviously, we know that we have water it can be a somewhat limited resource in terms of what's available to us in any given location, but a lot of people have different reasons for wanting to have a water-wise landscape or be, be a water-wise gardener. It can be anything from just conservation of our resources. It can be uh, conservation of our paychecks, uh, depending on where you are. And I think as time moves on, that'll change as well, but certainly the water bills can, can get us um, if you have a large landscape that you're managing. Um, and also it can just be conservation of our landscapes and our health. It's not just a matter of using less water, it's using it correctly and efficiently. And so the way we use water in our landscape can make a big difference to the health and wellness of our, our landscape. So we're going to talk about all those things. Kind of to set us up um, and uh, really hammer the point home as we jump into this, just looking at Georgia and I asked in the chat kind of where some people were joining us from and we have people from so many different counties even in this little group tonight, which is amazing. Um, and this, this data is a little bit old. It might be eight or 10 years old, but it's the gist is correct. Um, and just what I wanted to point out here is the population of our state is growing, um, constantly growing. It continues to grow. I think I just heard something on the news about how many more thousands of people were added to the state this year. And including, in addition to just the population growth, our urbanization is growing, which is pretty common in a lot of states across the southeast, including Georgia. And that urban landscape and the urban water use really impacts um, our water resources and how much water we have available um, to those 
senders. So think here. Over half of Georgia's population is in 12 counties, which is these dark blue counties, and over two thirds of them are in just 26 of our 159 counties. And this is us right here at, by us. I mean, where I'm coming from, which is Athens Clark County, you may see your own county um, represented here on the map, but this is little Athens Clark County and even Athens, which is the smallest county spatially, um, we, we have a really significant footprint as do I think many of the other counties that you all mentioned fall into one of these blue um, categories and it's constantly increasing. So this is a projection um, for much of this, but a lot of the, the counties around here, it's not a small increase as our population grows and our urbanization grows and maybe even our interest in landscaping, which we'll talk about is a great thing but our water use demands are not going down and they're not even staying the same. They're gonna to continue to rise. And so we're gonna look at the impact specifically of our outdoor water use and how we have control over that as gardeners and landscapers and stewards of that. So on average, residential water increases 30 to 50% during the summer, which is when we kick on our irrigation stuff. And all that to say is we're talking about one third to a half of our total water use is going outside. Um, which is a lot. Uh, and that's okay. I'm a gardener. I love my landscape. I prefer to have green all around me than, you know, brown all around me. But there's a lot of things that we can do to offset maybe how much it is that we're using. So just to give you an idea of, of what we're talking about is one portable lawn sprinkler operating for an hour uses about 360 gallons of water for one hour. So it's about six gallons a minute. Um, just to kind of give you mentally what that means, we're looking at 14 if you take five minute showers, cut that in half if you take longer showers, um, 26 dishwasher runs, 72 toilet flushes, and that for, this one gets me nine full loads of laundry. I always kind of feel it when I put in a full load of laundry, how much water I'm doing now that I have, uh, we have a new child in the house as well. So the laundry has increased significantly and I just, the amount of laundry we do. So that's nine loads of laundry just from running one sprinkler for one hour. Um, so it is significant the way we use our water. And like I said earlier, I'm not promoting, I'm not saying garden less. I'm not saying we don't want landscapes or to have flowers and to have these beautiful spaces. There's a whole nother talk we could give on just the benefits societally, both in um, a neighborhood setting, a citywide setting, or just in our own backyards of the environmental and social and mental and everything else impacts of beautiful landscaping. So this is not anti-landscaping. This is just a way for us to talk about different principles that we can apply to what we're doing to make everything we do water wise. So just be wise about how we're managing those resources. So what we're really gonna focus on, cause obviously it's a pretty big topic, um, but what we're gonna focus on in order to do this is the principles of xeriscaping. And we're about to talk about what that really means. And within that um, specifically wanna hammer down and focus in on proper irrigation principles. Um, so we'll be going, it, irrigation is obviously a principle of xeriscaping and irrigating properly, but we're gonna focus in specifically when we get to that section on proper irrigation and what that means. So xeriscaping, which I've already said it, but pronounced xeriscaping, uh, it was coined in Colorado out west where they're a very arid climate and they deal with water issues. Um, a lot and they've been dealing with them. And so as you can see, this was this concept was coined in the 80s. Uh, so a lot of really great resources and research comes out of Colorado as well. I'll go ahead and say feel like use University of Colorado resources and things that were developed there, but just be aware that not all of the plants that they're going to have. Some of them you can find here and will grow well here but maybe just check if you're going by one of their resources and check in and make sure that it's appropriate for our southeastern climate. But they have some great resources that are coming out of Colorado still. Um, so zeros means dry in Greek, and it really doesn't mean dry landscaping. A lot of people um, 
think that xeriscaping is kind of a desert-like arid landscaping. You can do xeriscaping anywhere and you can use the principles no matter how far on that scale you're willing to go. It really is just a way of landscaping with less water, doing more with less. So we're gonna go through it in the seven steps of xeriscaping. And I'm not gonna say each one out loud because we're about to go through all of them. But these are the seven steps, or I like to kind of, to me, it makes more sense the principles to consider while doing xeriscaping. Like I said, a lot of times when people say xeriscape, this is kind of the image that they have in mind. Um, while this could be a xeriscape, this can also be a xeriscape. So this is in Atlanta. This garden, I think two thirds of the garden is not irrigated at all. And the rest of it is very moderately irrigated. And the way they do that is through those seven principles or those seven steps that we're gonna kind of go through. So planning and design of your, of your space. Think through zones. So kind of think of your landscape and your garden in zones, and they can be high water use zones, which can also be called oasis zones. I kind of like that terminology, moderate water use zones and low water use zones. So oasis zones or high water use zones are gonna be typically wanna keep those smaller, but they can be really high impact or high visibility. So if you have certain plants or types of plants, I think one thing that comes to mind to me a lot is if you wanna have annual color um, or kind of pops of little annual gardens or beds and things like that, annuals tend to require more irrigation and, and water maintenance than perennials. One, because perennials have the chance to get established and get those root systems really developed and then they don't need the babying the annuals do. Um, but a lot of times our annual plants are temporary and quick growing, they fleshier, high color. And so they do tend to require a little more constant watering than our perennial uh, beds. But there might be other types of plants that just are not drought tolerant that you love and you wanna have in your gardens. That's fine. This is not a anti anything, um, philosophy. It's just to think through it smartly and, and plan accordingly. So if you have those plants, stick them up front, have a couple of those things right by your door where you're going to see them and remember to water them and also just kind of keep them in the small high impact areas rather than scattering them all over your, your uh, landscape. The moderate water use zones or transition zones are going to be things that are watered during establishment. So almost everything when you first plant it, needs to be watered. Um, I think this is something that we don't specifically touch on uh, on any of these slides later, but timing for establishment of things can make a difference in that. So there are certain things that are not super sensitive. If you're establishing shrubs and trees or even um, perennials, you can do that in the fall or, or even super early spring, late winter. And a lot of times if you do that and we get enough moisture and they get established well before the spring, they may not need a lot of watering ever, even during establishment, because you're establishing them at a time when they're not growing really fast and there's not a lot of heat stress. But a lot of things do need um, watering in at least while they're trying to get established. But these moderate um, zones are going to only after that establishment year or season, they're only going to need to be watered when we're having significant. It says when they show signs of water stress, as a horticulturist, you don't really want to let them get to that point where they're showing brown leaves or drooping or whatever. Um, but if we're getting to periods like we had a few weeks ago where we're having heat waves or we're having long periods of time without any water, supplemental water, and you just know that um, it's a more extreme time or we just have our 90 something degree days for several days on end, then these plants may still need some supplemental water. Some examples of these are listed below, certainly just a couple random examples, but so azaleas, dogwoods, redwoods, and a lot of herbaceous perennials, once you get them established, if you've had those in your yard, you know, since last year, I've had a lot of things, especially at this, uh, our, our office landscape, we have um, tons of herbaceous perennials here that we planted a couple of years ago. And even in that really difficult heat spell, we didn't, supplement any of them and they did fine because they've already really established um, their root systems and are ready to go. And then low water use zones would be even one step further where these are things that really just are drought tolerant plants by nature. And once they're established, they should be fine. They are developed and are they adapted in 
arid or, or um, desert like landscapes. And they're just sort of like, you don't have to worry about them anymore. And those are some examples of that. Um, So again, this is a principle rule of thumb. This is not, you don't have to go out and measure the square footage of the different zones in your garden, but think through the ideas to have maybe about 10% of your landscape in this oasis zone, 10 or less, to be honest, just out of necessity at my house, I now have pretty much no oasis zone and it's more just because I'll forget and I'll kill them and I'm tired of buying new plants. Um, so I have more like a one to 0% of my oasis zone, but you wanna try to stay at about 10 or less for that high impact, constantly uh, maintained area. And then 30% ish can be the moderate zone. And then you want about two thirds like that landscape that we showed um, from Atlanta earlier. You, the idea is about two thirds of your landscape could potentially just be left alone and not have to be irrigated. Other things when you're considering planning is maybe um, aspects of shade in your garden. This could be something like a cool, gazebo pergola situation like that, but wood is very expensive. And while I would love a giant pergola in my backyard, it'll be a while before I get there, but trees do the same thing. So when you're either, if you're moving into a new space and you have established trees already, or you're thinking through what you want to plant, where having a few zones in your um, landscape that you can um, plan around some trees, that really reduces transpiration and, and um, evaporation under those huge tree canopies and that can reduce overall water needs of your your yard and your landscape and then this is sort of an example suggestion a lot of times when we do those high impact oasis plants or we want a, a real pop of color and and brightness and fun decoration and, and impact really containers can be a great option for that one it's kind of easy to maintain a great uh fertile well-drained, um, conducive area for high impact, high fast growing plants in containers. Um, but also it's a really easy way to maintain efficient water use, even though it's something that needs a relatively high amount of water, you can stick a couple of drip emitters in a container and really just give it what it needs without trying to water a large area and keep keep them all happy. So that be it. In terms of soil analysis, uh, we always push soil testing whenever we can um, through both all of our master gardeners know, know that and they talk to a lot of the clients about that as a first step in terms of plant health. And here we talk about soil testing a lot in terms of what is the pH and what are the nutrient balances in the soil and those are always important to plant health and a healthy plant is going to be a more efficient plant in general. But what I want to kind of talk about with our time that we do have here is organic matter in soil. So think about, do you need to amend your soil? What is the texture of your soil? If you're, it seemed like all the people that we have on here today are still sort of in the North Georgia Piedmont area, I believe. And so most of us are gonna have a really a heavy clay soil, rather if you get further down in the state, it's gonna be more of a sandy soil. Either way, adding organic, matter to our soils before we start to landscape on them, whether it's laying a lawn or a garden bed or what have you, can really help in the health and water efficiency of those landscapes. And the reason for that is having a good soil texture will help water infiltrate into the ground. Um, so clay is dense and it holds water really well, but it has to absorb that water for it to have access to it and hold it in a bank to begin with. And so we have these summer storms, like I don't know if you all experienced some this afternoon, but over here in Clark County, we had a nice big one um, a couple hours ago, and that's really common. We get a lot of decent rain in the summer here, but it comes all at once and a lot and quickly. And then we get a lot of hot weather, the soil dries out again, and then we get a big dump of rain and that's just the way it works here. And if you think through having a, a really dense, clay heavy soil, it's gonna dry up or even if it's not super, super dry, all that water is just like pouring a bucket on top of a clay soil. It cannot absorb all that water as fast as we can get it in our summer um, rains. And so by adding 
organic matter, which sort of fluffs up and, and increases the soil pores and the improves the friability and the texture of that soil, then all of a sudden we're able to absorb and take advantage of more of the rain that does fall. And that can go deeper down in the soil profile. Um, in terms of just drainage, which we'll talk about in a second, it can also help because our soils, while good at holding water, can sometimes be too good at holding water. Um, and I know we're talking about managing the amount of water we put on, but as a gardener, that's always an issue in the Piedmont is keeping our soils from staying soggy and holding too much water and harming the roots of our soil. So either way, the organic matter really helps. If you happen to be in a sandier soil, it's going to help sand just leaches that that water just goes straight through it. And so having the organic matter is going to kind of help in the opposite way where it'll help act as a sponge and hold the water that it does absorb. So um, great thing to consider and one thing you can certainly have control over and amend in your garden. When you do amend for organic matter, um, uh, it's a big question of, okay, so I want to add organic matter, but how much do I add? But rule of thumb is if you want to change the texture, any organic matter can help in a lot of different ways, chemically and all these other things, which we don't, it's not what this talk is about. But if you want to improve the texture of your soil, the rule of thumb is 25 to 30% by volume is kind of what you want to get incorporated into that. So just as an example, but it could be different, you know, depth for you. If you're trying to amend 12 inches of soil, then you're going to want to try to incorporate about three to four inches of organic matter and incorporate that really well into those 12 inches. And that'll, that's enough to kind of give you a difference and make an improvement and a change in that soil texture. Very rough numbers, but a, a, an easy kind of thing to remember. And a lot of times if it's more, it's not so much shrubs and trees, but we're just doing some perennials, you may be able to cut that back to like six inches and, and only have to worry about finding because, you know, three or four inches over a large area can be a lot of organic matter to come up with, a lot of compost or um, soil amendment. But um, yeah, of course, plant selection is going to be huge. So um I think you can use any of these principles on any plants that you already have in your garden or that you want to use in your garden, but planning your the plants that you do plant has a very large impact on how much water you're going to have to apply to your landscape. And so there are a few things if you don't just happen to know if a plant is um, water efficient or adapted to handle less water um, during the year. Some things that you can look for are things that have uh, fleshy roots or tubers things like daylilies, irises, dahlias, um, they all have these kind of storage capacities underground. And so much like succulents have them in their leaves, they have a, an organ in there within the body of the plant that can hold on to the water when it is available so that when it's not available, they're not suffering. So that's one thing. Those plants tend to be more resilient in the face of less water. Something else is um, plants that are finely divided uh, or have rough or gray or hairy texture. Um, so that grayness is actually all the hairy, the rough and the gray are all types of trichomes, which are like tiny hairs that exist on plants. And obviously the fuzzy ones, the rough ones and the hairy ones are different shapes and types of trichomes. But in all of them, what that does is if you zoom in microscopically, um, these thousands of little hairs that are on the surface of the plant, they act as a way to trap almost like cloud, you know, trap in the moisture that is transpired constantly from plant leaves. And that creates um, a physical difference where it's more moist than the rest of the surrounding arid air against the plant surface. And that prevents the plants from losing nearly as much water through their pores, the stomata and the leaves. And so that's something that's been adapted by many, many plants that, that were developed in areas where that was necessary. But that's kind of a nice um, mental thing. If you're in the garden center, you're thinking through, you know, I, I want to start planting this area in my yard where I don't have access to irrigation or I want to just keep it more water wise. Um, what are some ones that'll do okay there? And you can kind of the fuzzy ones and the rough ones and the, the gray ones um, tend to be already there plants that are adapted for that type of 
um, situation. And so these are just some examples. These are less apparent. They are not really fuzzy, but they have more of a rough. A lot of people know Lantana has that real sandpapery feeling. Those are also types of adapted trichomes um, that do the same thing as those little hairs. Also, um, plants that just are native to arid areas. So these are all examples of things that are native to the um, southwestern United States where it's a little more arid out there. So if you know that something is was developed or adapted um, in an arid area, and that's a tip off that it would probably do well in a low water use zone. Uh, another type of plant that can do well in these low water use areas are going to be low to the ground ground covers. And part of the reason for that is they sort of form their own natural mulch. And so they're covering this big area. Uh, they have such dense foliage and they're so close to the ground and they hug the ground. And so the moisture that does exist in the soil, it's kind of like if you had you know, cardboard or something on the ground, it's trapped in there and they're able to take advantage of it and it doesn't evaporate off. Uh, they kind of create their own little pocket underneath uh, where they can maintain some decent moisture and take advantage of it. Um, and then also we mentioned, and a lot of people are already aware that uh, plants like succulents do well in uh, arid situ or low water use situations. And it's both because they have the fleshy leaves that can store the water for long periods of time. And they always, they also tend to be covered in a, a wax cuticle, a wax covering, which prevents that evaporation that a lot of other plants, the water is going to be essentially sucked out of them. And that waxy covering um, prevents that in these plants. So a lot, I, these are just a couple of examples for each one of these um, categories, but there's many out there that you can take advantage of. Is not really a type of plant, but something else to consider. And we sort of mentioned it earlier in the low water use zones, but established healthy trees and large shrubs, they really almost never ever need to be irrigated. So they are kind of a wonderful, you know, green focal point, background, um, scaffolding, whatever to a landscape. So if you have established trees in a landscape, sometimes people tend to want to just sort of in a new space or an old space, kind of cut everything down and start new. Um, obviously totally up to you, but the established trees are gonna be a no water input kind of um, aspect to your, your landscape. And, and I've also had people when we have tough weather, we'll call and kind of ask how much or if they need to irrigate their trees. And honestly, even in pretty intense situations, there's, it's very rare that you would have to uh, irrigate a tree of this size. They just have such a massive range of their roots um, at this point in their lives that it's, it's uncommon. Um, when talking about turf, so if you do have a lawn or you wanna establish a lawn, there is a difference. Not all turf is created equal in terms of water use. There's cool and warm season turfs. The cool season are always tend to be less drought tolerant, um, but even of the warm season, there is a difference. The Bermuda grasses are by far the most drought tolerant. Zoysia is fairly drought tolerant, but when it comes to drought tolerance or, or water needs, Bermuda is extremely efficient. And the high, some of the hybrid ones, they constantly are breeding for different things, but some of the newer hybrid ones that you can get, if you're going to put down sod or something are really very water efficient. Having said that, in general, turf tends to be um, one of the largest water use zones of most landscapes. Um, so everything sort of it depends. Bermuda grass is really water efficient, but people who are lawn people or who want this really lush, beautiful part, their lawn to be, you know, a focal point of their yard. If you're managing your lawn really properly, which I don't manage my lawn properly, it looks decent, but I don't manage it the way you could manage it to really have it be um, a focus of your landscape. If you're managing even a Bermuda grass lawn and you're fertilizing it the way you're supposed to and you're mowing it constantly the way you're supposed to, it can still um, take a decent amount of water compared to these our low water use zones that we talked about. So all this to say is I'm not anti-lawn. I think it's beautiful and it has its purposes. 
But the principle for xeriscaping is just have turf grass for a purpose. If it's for the aesthetic value of that, that beautiful lawn look, have it situated in a place where it's considered, we say welcome mat, but you know, this area right in front of your house or the pathway up to your house where you get that aesthetic value. Um, or if it's a recreational service, uh, surface, great, have it, you know, if you're, you want to play soccer or run around in the yard with your kids or your dog, that's fine. Um, and even sometimes if it's a steep slope and that's one of the only things you can have erosion control, but there are also other options for erosion control. But the point is don't just have it to have it. Um, a lot of landscapes that are just newly developed because that's what the, the contractors or whatever can do at the time is it needs to be covered. They can't even get a certificate of the, the property until areas are covered. So they put lawn on it. Um, but I would say if you're trying to be water wise and efficient, don't just have turf to have turf. There's so many other things that you can put in there that we have talked about and we'll talk about. Just decide what you want and why you want it and focus on that obviously kind of an older picture, but this is kind of an example of what we're talking about with that welcome mat idea. You can have a beautifully maintained turf area, but it doesn't necessarily need to be your entire landscape. And then, so this is what I was talking about um, at the beginning is efficient irrigation, um, which is one of the seven principles, but kind of obviously a super important aspect of water wise. So when we talk about efficient irrigation, there are four watering principles. This is from the Center for Urban Ag um, here uh, with the university that we wanna look at. And the first principle is supply adequate water to plants. Obviously we don't wanna, um, we don't want them to get drought stressed, but don't overwater them. And that's harder to do than you would think. A lot of landscapes are overwatered to the detriment of the resource, um, our pocketbooks and the plant themselves. So overwatering really happens a lot and has a lot of um, issues with it. So if you overwater, you're really displacing the oxygen in the soil. So it, plants need oxygen, their roots need oxygen, um, and we can drown them and cause uh, root rot. That's a very common issue. We get root rot issues into the office all the time, which can hinder the growth. It can also leach the nutrients out of your soil. So you have your soil profile here in your root zone. And the idea is to keep this root zone, whether it's six inches or 12 inches or what, what have you, with enough moisture for the plants to, to maintain and access the moisture. But that's also where all the nutrients are that you're you know applying if you apply an amendment or a fertilizer. And if you put too much water in it, then you're having the water just leach through that root zone if your soil drains well enough. And if it doesn't drain well enough, you're just uh, rotting your root zone but you can lose a lot of your nutrients out of your root zone that way. And then all of these things can increase uh, disease potential. And then of course, that's a waste of water. So how much water do plants need? So it's easy to come on here and say, well, water your plants enough. Don't water them too much, but um, how much is enough? There's some, the rule of thumb for most plants, whether it's turf or landscape plants, is about one inch of water a week, typically. Um, if it's an area of your yard that just gets blasted by afternoon sun, or we have these heat waves, or it hasn't, you know, whatever, or it's newly established, that rule of thumb may change a little bit. Newly established plants are kind of in their own. You do need to baby newly established lawns and plants, but all else equal, um, plants need about an inch of water a week. We'll talk about um, scheduling for that. But a good thing to keep in mind is an inch of water um, per square foot is about 6.2 gallons. So how many square feet for your plants? It's kind of just think about where the root zone of that plant would be. And so if you're watering in a garden bed that you have planted and it's so many square feet, you can kind of think through, okay, an inch of water is going to be about six gallons for each of those square feet of my water bed. And this can come in really handy if you're setting up a drip irrigation, or even if you have a sprinkler system, um, calibrating your sprinkler system is really easy. It requires like a handful of tuna cans or cat food cans or something. You just lay them out in a 
randomized pattern where your sprinkler is going and you run your sprinkler for about 10 minutes and then see how much is in those cans. Cause you can't, I can't tell you how much your, your sprinkler system is putting out. It depends on this, the actual emitter and it depends on the pressure of your home and the water coming out of your tap and everything else. It's very easy to figure out though, just that go buy some tuna. Um, but yeah, so then you can kind of look at that and see how many inches you're putting out when you're when you run your sprinkler and engage if you're doing the right amount or not. Um, the second watering principle is water the roots, not the foliage. This sounds really um, obvious, but sometimes also it's just harder to do. Uh, I know sometimes I'm caught out. I don't want to uncoil my hose all the way in the front yard and so I just sort of point over to areas of my garden and get them the best I can. It's not ideal um, for a number of reasons. If you can get underneath the base of any plant while you're watering instead of watering overhead, it's much better for the plant. Um, most disease causing pathogens, the bacteria and the fungi require that moisture on the plant leaves to infect the plant. And then we also have going against us here in Georgia that it's like 90% humidity a lot of the summer. And so it does not evaporate off very quickly sometimes. So it really can um, increase disease pressure on our plants. But then also in a water use efficiency context, you're spraying things through that, you're spraying your water through the air and putting it all over the surface area of the leaves and it's getting evaporated off and you're really just not getting the water where you need it or not, you're, you're losing it significant percentage of it to evaporation before it ever um, gets to the root zone, which is where we actually need it is to soak into the soil. Um, third watering principle, water deeply and infrequently. This is the one I see not followed probably the most of all four of the principles. And you really want to, I would, in most cases, and especially we can get away with it because our clays are really pretty good at holding water. Um, we don't lose it out the bottom like the sandy soils as much, but you should generally try to water one good deep watering about once a week. So try to get that inch or inch and a half as the case may be, try to get it all in one watering. And when I say one watering, it could be that if you're, especially if you're on a slope or something like that, if the water starts to pool and move away, then you have to set your timer or change your timing and let it absorb and then go back and water a little bit more. So it might take some playing with the timing of that, but you wanna get all that water down really deep, that inch kind of pushed into the soil all at one time, give the soil a chance to dry out and then do it again, rather than just continuously sprinkling water over the top and keeping the top of the soil damp. And the reasons for that are that if you keep just watering the top of the soil over and over again. One, you're not allowing your roots to explore the soil and move down and develop a, a good root system, which can then withstand drought conditions in the future. Um, think about if we have, we water our plants, um, or we just say, think about you have this plant and this plant, and we go through several days without any rain, and this whole portion of the soil dries out. Well, this plant's going to be okay because it's still got two thirds of its root system down below that, and there's still moisture down here. But this plant's going to be a goner because all of this will be dry. It has no access to any of the moisture down there, um, and it's out of luck. Another for plant, uh, not plant health, but water efficiency is if you just keep watering the top of the soil like this, well, that top inch or two of soil can dry off very quickly in the summer, especially if it's not covered by plant canopy or mulch or anything. Whereas if you're able to get that water several inches down into the soil in our clay, the water down here at two, three, four, five, six inches is not going to evaporate off of the surface. It's pretty protected down there in kind of a bank of water. Um, so you really want to water deeply. So I won't, I'll leave you alone on that, but that's a big one. And then the fourth principle is water, uh, according to specific plant needs. So, you know, all of your plants do not need the same amount of water. And that really goes all the way back to our idea of the zones. So we talked about our zones in terms of thinking through what percentage of our landscape is gonna be low, low water use, medium and high. 
but also you want to kind of spatially group those together. And if you have any kind of irrigation set up, you want to set your irrigation up so that you have one kind of irrigation system or zone or however you're doing it devoted to your oasis zones, but you don't want that to be the same timer and zone and in nozzles or whatever the case may be as you have for your moderate or your low use, because then you're just either overwatering some plants that aren't going to like it, or you're underwatering other plants. Um, and it's just not a good efficient use of uh, your water resources. So yeah, all that to say is your lawn may need different water than your flower bed, your fruits and vegetable gardens probably needs to be on its own situation in terms of um, watering or irrigation other parts of components of your landscape you might want to consider parsing out would be ground cover ground covers and then shrubs and trees um so just think through that if you're setting up your water timing and then speaking of hold on let me oh see i didn't even realize i left these in there but this is good speaking of setting those up having a timer and this is kind of a heavy duty some of y'all may have something like this especially if you have lawns um, not everybody's going to have a timer that's quite uh, as expensive and sophisticated as this one. These are fantastic. You can set up like four or five or six zones where they can come on at different times and water different amounts. Um, but even just having a little, you know, $10, $20 timer from Home Depot can do a lot. So if you have a drip line or a sprinkler system or whatever the case may be timers can do a lot for you one is once you've calibrated how much you want to put out you can be consistent about that and just set your timer to put out the amount that you need to to put out an inch of water it takes a long time to stand there and water um, an inch into the garden so putting a timer on there might make you actually more likely to do that rather than just standing there for a few minutes each day. Another thing that a timer does that'll help with water efficiency and plant health is it's really best to water, especially your lawn, if it's gonna be an overhead sprinkler situation, but almost anything early in the morning before most of us wanna get up and before most of us have had our coffee and wanna stand out in the garden. So if you can have a timer set so that it's coming on at like four or five, um, in the morning, that's going to be the most efficient time to get that water into uh, the soil. It won't evaporate as much as it's flying through the air. And it whatever does land on your lawn or on your foliage will then evaporate when the sun comes out and won't be sitting there all night um, uh, on your plants, which can cause disease. And you won't be doing it in the middle of your day, which will be a lot of evapotranspiration going evaporation happening as you're watering, um, which is not efficient. Uh, Laurie, uh, who was on here earlier with us and spoke with us and I have been dying to do an in-person drip irrigation workshop here soon. And so we're trying to get one of those on the books for October. Drip is just fantastic, both for plant health and for um, water use efficiency. It's it's intimidating sometimes if you've never set up a drip system and it sounds very official and complicated, but I swear it's really similar to Legos. Um, and once you just have the basic principle of you need this, this, and this, like a filter and a pressure regulator and whatever, and we'll go through all of those in that workshop um, when we do it, it's really easy to set up and it's not even very expensive. All the components are very affordable. You can order them from a bunch of different places um, once you kind of know what you need. So drip is going to be by far the most efficient because it's coming out slowly. And we talked about that absorption. So either in a pretty dense, even in a dense um, soil situation, all of that water, it's coming out so slowly that it has time to really drip down and absorb as it's getting emitted into the soil. There's none of it sitting on the surface or rolling off or anything like that. And it's just going, I had a picture in here that I think I took out, but it's just going to your plants, which can help a lot with weeds. So it's actually, you don't really usually equate drip irrigation with weed management, but having drip irrigation can even help you. You're not gonna be spending a lot of that water budget on watering weeds, which will then grow up and then you have to take care of those weeds. Um, but also it's under the canopy of your plant and not flying through the air. So you're not losing hardly any of it to um, evaporation. And you can just really pinpoint because all these different emitters can have different amounts of water that are let out. So we talked about um, watering each of their plants according to their needs. 
and you're able to do that really easily with drip emitters because you can um, change those out to different amounts um, according to the plant. So it really sort of drip encompasses a lot of those irrigation principles and makes them um, all a lot easier to uh, employ. So my soapbox. Um, we talked about this. This says 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. That um, that solves the problem of evaporative loss of water. But honestly, if you can, you don't have like a massive landscape that has to go on multiple different zones throughout several hours. Uh, I am a fan of doing it more super early morning, like four o'clock in the morning, rather than in the middle of the night at night or at 9 p.m. or something. And that's mostly for plant disease um, reasons. We talked about that. Um, use of mulches. So this cannot be overlooked when we're talking about water efficiency. Mulch is extremely helpful for the plant and water efficiency. So mulch can prevent water loss from the soil surface. So basically it's just a covering and it prevents a lot of that evaporation during our hot um, summers in the middle of the sun. Um, it prevents soil borne diseases. So the reason for that is that a lot of our foliar diseases and things that we get on, whether it's our landscape plants or our vegetable plants like our tomatoes and things, they're really kind of omnipresent diseases that dwell in the soil and there's nothing wrong with them in the environment, but they just lurk out there. And they're not a problem until they come in contact with the leaves of the plant and they have that moisture that we talked about and they're able to infect the plant. And the way that they get there a lot of times is just splashing. And so that splashing can be in, increased by overhead irrigation, but also just happens with water. These big hard storms come down and you get splashing from the soil. And so what mulch can do is it creates a barrier um, on top of your soil so that that splashing doesn't happen up from the soil onto your plants. It also insulates the roots of plants from extreme heat or cold. It's just kind of a, a blanket and keeps things moderate. Um, and then reduces weed competition. So what's there not to love? Um, what's the best kind of mulch? Uh, organic mulch, and when I say organic mulch, I don't really mean organic, like OMRI certified organic mulch, like no chemicals. Organic meaning like it's from a living carbon-based something. So a wood mulch, a bark mulch, uh, pine straw is super readily available where we are, so that's a really common mulch. Some people like to use their leaves as mulch. But the reason for that is that organic matter, carbon-based things, as opposed to something that's like a rubber type mulch or things like that, or even rocks and, and that kind of thing, uh, the synthetic mulches absorb a lot of heat. And then are especially in here in Georgia, that can be an issue. They can get very, very hot. And then that doesn't really help um, with the heat insulation aspect of it. But organic mulches are great and fine textured. Part of the reason for that is that they don't, um float away and get this um uh dislodged and especially on slopes here in the piedmont we have a lot of landscapes that are not super flat and having the really um bulky uh mulch it can get um moved it can get floated very easily uh and then non-matting i'm trying to think um of something that wouldn't mat very easily but um like if you wanted to use something too fine textured, like a sawdust, wood chip, like uh, shavings and things like that, you just have to be careful that whatever you're putting down is not gonna form uh, a cake in a mat because once that wets and dries, it can actually form a barrier for water to get through and then you're not, it, it sort of defeats the purpose. You're actually keeping water out from under your mulch. So you don't wanna do that. Pine straw is great, readily available. Uh, chipped kind of um, hardwood, hardwood chip mulch is great. Uh, the bark mulch is great. How much mulch should you put on? Three to five inches. I would, if you get above five inches, you run the risk of smothering your plants. So plants do need some oxygen. And if you get too, too thick, then you're, you might be starting to um, choke out the feeder roots on the top of your soil where your plants are putting out roots, which is not good. So don't, you don't need any more than five inches, three, four, maybe five inches is plenty to do what you need it to do. Um, again, if you're wondering what that means in real terms, a bale of pine straw covers about 50 square feet. 
it when you're doing that. And pine straw settles, but if you apply it at three to five inches, that should be fine, even though it sort of is gonna settle down. Um, and here's another example of how to convert real life um, units into the three to five, three inch depth. Um, something else to consider when you're putting mulches down, never put it up to the base of your plants. So if you have a small shrub or tree or whatever, do that three to five inches, that's great, but make sure you go in and you pull out the mulch and you can kind of slant it or you can just pull it out. You don't want the mulch touching, hugging up against the base of the plant. Uh, the problem with that is your, your roots are designed to handle moisture and things and be covered up, but the crown and base of your plant is really not adapted to have something up against it all the time. So having that constant moisture can cause rot and disease and fungal issues that can infect it and also can even be conducive to uh, well, moles or voles, excuse me, um, and insects and sort of invite them to come up right against the, the plant. So always kind of pull them away, pull it away a little bit. And then one of the last things I'm going to talk about, and I, I was afraid that my presentation was too long, so I cut it down a little bit, but we'll have plenty of time for questions here after this, but just management in general can actually have a, a real impact in your water efficiency, and a lot of people don't realize that. And so uh, a couple of things that you can do to improve water efficiency is consider how you fertilize and consider how you prune. And then we already talked about irrigation. Um, so for fertilization, the reason that fertilization makes any difference in water use efficiency is that if you're fertilizing at the wrong time, you're forcing new um, flushes of green growth, which require a lot of water. So not only do they require a lot of water, but also that fresh, new, soft green growth is going to transpire a lot of water as well. They don't not um, as hardened as the older growth. So you typically, unless it's a very specific situation, obviously vegetables are kind of in their own realm, um, but you typically don't want to be fertilizing heavily in the summer in the kind of highest heat stress times of the year. That's going to be really hard for your plant and it's going to require a lot of water to maintain that growth that it has to put out. Um, you know, fertilize when they're already actively growing when they need it. Um, slow release fertilizers rather than big pulses of nitrogen will help from them having to bolt and put out a lot of um, fl uh, flushes of growth. Yeah, so that's what we talked about. Um, I think I don't have the slide here on pruning, but one way that pruning can make a difference is similarly. Generally, you don't want to be doing heavy pruning during high, you know, during the summer um, and high heat times of the year anyway, because it, it's a time where you're making wounds all over the plant when fungal and bacterial um, diseases are prevalent and it's warm and it's humid and um, you could introduce some disease into them. So a lot of times you want to prune um, kind of in our area, February-ish, any of that heavy pruning when it's cooler outside, it's also because when you prune a plant, that's a really stressful time for the plant. They have to deal with compartmentalizing that wound and deal with the stress of a pruning. Sometimes it's necessary, but it's always going to be a stress on the plant. So you don't want to add stress to a plant in the middle of the summer. Um, but similarly, pruning, just like fertilizing, is an impulse to the plant to put out new growth. So when you prune plants, it triggers them to put out additional growth. And so you don't want to be doing that because that's very highly water intensive for the plant. So you don't want to do that um, when you're already um, in a stressful time. And then this is not pruning necessarily, sort of pruning, I guess mowing your lawn is pruning your grass. But um, when you mow your lawn, and this is from good authority from our turf specialist at UGA, it is perfectly fine to leave the uh, clippings on your lawn. One exception to that, and I speak from experience, is I definitely forget to mow my lawn or don't have time to mow my lawn as frequently as I should. And so my Bermuda grass lawn in the backyard sometimes will go crazy and it's like, oh my goodness, I should have mowed that, you know, two weeks ago. If you know you're going to have to cut a whole lot of grass, sometimes you don't want to leave all of that. You might want to bag that and move it off. And that's just because that's going to mat 
it's such a large amount of grass material that that could mat on top of your grass and physically cause an issue for it. But other than that, if you're just doing um, routine mowing, leaving the grass clippings in the soil can help. It can um, replenish the nitrogen and phosphorus from those grass clippings. Some of it can be reabsorbed into the soil. It adds organic matter. And it is not what thatch is caused by. A lot of times people are worried about leaving the grass clippings on top of their lawn because they're worried that that's going to contribute to thatch. But thatch is the natural um, structures of the lawn itself that grow over time and over the year that cause the thatch buildup. It's not going to be your grass clippings that are left on there. Leaving your grass clippings is kind of like mulching your lawn, and that can actually help improve water efficiency for your lawn. And that's it. This is our inspirational photo here to end our talk on. Um, so it's only 7.03. Uh, I know maybe you had sped through that just a little bit, but I'm happy any of these talks, you sort of, it's it's guessing what is what the audience needs to hear most in terms of where they're at and where what you guys are doing with your gardens or what your plans might be for your landscape or what questions you have about water-wise landscaping. So feel free to, to ask um, specific questions or anything that I didn't touch on that you were hoping to hear. I'm, I'm done with I'm gonna that. jump in, Laura. We did have a question um, when you were talking about mulching from mm -hmm. Mike and um, he was asking, uh, do some mulches deplete nitrogen in some cases? That's a great question that we get a lot. <clears throat> so you may have heard, or maybe you've never heard, but there's people warn against using non-rotted or fresh wood chips and things like that, any kind of fresh carbon source in your garden. So really the issue with using that type of fresh organic, uh, fresh carbon resource like fresh wood chips is if it gets in, like mushed into or incorporated into the soil itself, it can it can suck the, car the nitrogen out of your soil. And it's basically just because um, microorganisms use carbon and they use nitrogen and so if you give them a bunch of carbon they're going to want to break it down but in order to break down the carbon they have to have nitrogen so they'll pull it out of the soil rather than putting it into the soil so that's really more of an issue if it's going to get incorporated i've talked to several people at the university because we get that question all the time and if it's just going to lay on top of the surface it, it really shouldn't be an issue if you're really worried about it um what I've seen people do is if they have access to a bunch of fresh wood chips, um, put that in the paths or the places that you don't have anything growing in right now, but use it as that kind of mulch. And then you can also leave it to quote unquote rot or mature for a year or so, and it'll break down a little bit and turn kind of more friable in that darker brown. And at that point, it's been, um, the carbon has been broken down to a great degree and it's not going to do that kind of uh, carbon or nitrogen robbing that I was talking about. But if it's just lying on the surface, it's not going to make a big difference. That's a really good question. That is a really great <clears throat> question. I was just uh, reading about that the other day. I did not know. Um, we also have another question from Brooke. She said um, it might be easier if she just asks it. So Either I don't to unmute. Brooke, are you there? Hello. Hi. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good, sorry. Um, okay, so when mixing different type of plants that are next to each other, some that don't need water and some that do need water, how to control that? Is that more of a drip situation? Maybe I just answered my own question. Yeah, no, no, well, not yet. <laughs> Do you, just out of curiosity, are there specific plants that you're thinking of or have? Um, of course, it's drawing a blank right now. But for one thing that um, I have seen is I work at Pike during the spring mm -hmm. and they, I saw this planter come in, it, like a container, you know, like a hanging basket yeah. that the nursery had made. And they had put in like um, uh, porcha laca mm -hmm. and um, 
begonias. First mm-hmm. off, I would have never put them together for sun. And then um, some other things for water. And I was so confused. And I asked one of the, the girl who does the ordering and she said, well, hopefully the one plant will take the water where the, you know, where the other one doesn't need it. But I just, I would have never have mixed those type of plants together. And then it confused me for my own gardens, basically. Yeah, so. I guess. So well, I'm not, this is no anti pie. I like pike a lot. It's a great uh, nursery provider, but I, I would say according to our principles and what we teach is not to mix, try not to mix like really heavily mingle plants that have really diverse water needs. And it's just because you don't want to overwater the portalaca or whatever the, you know, arid loving plant might be. One is some of those plants just don't want wet feet and they'll, they'll get rot and they might not survive. Um, and two is you don't want to waste water on a plant that doesn't need it. And you want to make sure that the begonia or whatever the case may be is getting enough water. So really, I would just advise not to put those things literally on top of each other. But yes, you're correct. that Like if you have a landscape and maybe something already exists, or you just really want this kind of visual component of two things that aren't the same. So like juniper and then maybe something behind it that does need a little more water try to just focus in with something like a drip where you're you're supplying right to the plant that needs the water but okay. not to everything okay yeah. thank you good Appreciate question it. Yeah. thanks um laura we've got another question in the chat gerald asked um that you mentioned the use of native plants um he asked if there'll be an upcoming lecture regarding the use of georgia native plants in the landscape that is i'm glad you asked that i'm trying to think i don't think one so we plan our green them lectures kind of all at once in one year and i will plug our uh like carrie mentioned at the beginning we send out an evaluation every month and there's always a spot on there for topics that you want to see for future green thumb lectures. So please mention that in there because we go back and look at those when we're planning. Um, there's a good chance that we will do something on natives here coming up. We actually planted um, like 10,000 square feet around our new newish extension office and just natives. Um, one, because it's beautiful, but also because we want to use it as like a teaching demonstration landscape where you're able to kind of see how different natives look in the landscape and get examples of different ones. Um, and what it's really been sort of inadvertently is this whole landscape has become a zero escape landscape because we don't want to water it all the time. Um, I, I used drip irrigation to get the whole thing established. And since it was established two years ago, we have not put a drop of water on it and everything's alive and everything's doing great. And so not all natives are drought tolerant, but we have probably eight, six, 60 different types of plants out here. Um, and they're, they're doing fabulously. Um, and so it's been really fun to see how they've really held on in the conditions that they've been put in. Um, so I, yeah, all that to say is we do like to focus on native education. And so if you wanna email Carrie or myself after this, we try to keep interest lists so that we remember when we do actually offer programming, if there was somebody that had reached out about it, we can send you an email. Um, also, I think it was on that, I should be putting this up, that's a good, time to put this up. We do a Shades of Green newsletter and it's just a once a month digital newsletter that we put out and we try to put all of the programming um, and educational things both that we're offering coming up but also that are just going on in the area so the botanical garden events and things and if other organizations have plant sales or um, garden tours or anything related kind of to gardening we try to include that in that newsletter so if that's something that I know y'all are not all in the immediate Athens area um, but if you're interested in finding out about other stuff that we're doing, that's a good way to do it too. Um, so I know that's roundabout. All that I'm sure we will be doing some native programming. If you want to see it in a green thumb lecture, leave it in the evaluation. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. That was really informative. I took so many notes on there. Um, and I really liked the 10%, 30%, 60% from the beginning. I think that's a really great. It's easier to do than you would think too. I mean, and, and a lot of it, and I, I say it kind of jokingly with my own yard, but it, it makes it easier on the gardener too, if you just have 
certain areas that are the oasis zones that you know you have to keep up with and then a lot of the rest of it you don't have to worry about as much yeah yeah and then you can have some of those um you know more water hungry plants let's say in that 10 percent zone some special things there um, that was super great. So uh, Laura put up the uh, final uh, slide here and it's got some information for y'all on it. Um, there's a QR code you can scan um, with your phone right now and that'll take you to the post-class survey that Laura was talking about. Um, our email addresses are there if you want to email us um, to be added to the Shades of Green uh, e-newsletter list. Um, we'd be happy to do that. And um, then on the right there, you'll see some information for our next Green Thumb Lecture on August 10th. And you can register for that at accgov.com slash gardening. And you do have to register um, to um, participate and we'll send you the Zoom link just like this time. And um, it would really help us out if you wanna fill out the survey. We'll also send you the link in the post-class email, which we'll be sending out in a few days. Um, and it really helps us develop the programming. And um, we really appreciate you being here with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Laura, for a wonderful presentation. And um, we hope you'll have a great evening and we look forward to seeing you again at the Green Thumb Lecture. Thank you all and happy gardening. <laughs>